This is Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. I'm your host, Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College of Business and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. My guest today is Senator Jeff Sessions. Senator Sessions, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. Good to, good to be with you. I almost don't know what to say. Do I say General Sessions? Do I say Senator Sessions? You've <laughs> you get it them. right. <laughs> well, people in Alabama knew me mostly as Senator, um, but I did have two years as Attorney General of the United States and two in Alabama. Well, you've got a, an, an incredible resume. I mean, after you graduated from the University of Alabama School of Law in 1973, you served in the U.S. Army Reserve, achieving the rank of Captain. You served as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Alabama. You served as the 44th Attorney General of Alabama. You served as United States Senator from Alabama from 1997 to 2000 and, uh, 2017. You were elected to the Senate in 1996, re-elected in 2002, 2008, and 2014, and you were the 84th United States Attorney General. In that long and storied career, what accomplishments are you most proud of? <laughs> Um, it's hard to say. I, I try not to think too much about that, really. I don't, I, a lot of people say, this is going to be your legacy. My honest view was that it was my duty to go to work every day to advance the interest of the United States of America and the people of Alabama. And so you make hundreds and hundreds and thousands of decisions, and I think it's a mistake for somebody to say, well, I'm going to serve six years in the Senate and uh, I'm going to pass one bill, and I'm just going to. I, I really think it's so hard to predict what can happen in Congress. Now you have goals. I had real goals. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed my 12 years as United States Attorney under Ronald Reagan and Bush. He, Reagan appointed me, and we felt like we really made a difference on crime. Uh, I, we had to fix the office of United States Attorney General, Alabama Attorney General. It was in a financial catastrophe. I had to fire the first day a third of the office, reorganize it completely, and then shortly thereafter, Heflin announced his retirement within months. And so uh, I decided to, to make that race. But so that was a challenge, but it was very rewarding. And then we were able to turn the office over to, to Bill Pryor, who served, elected twice, and uh, uh, now the chief judge at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. He was on the short list for the U.S. Supreme Court. Great, great lawyer. And then Richard Allen, who was a chief deputy, and, and Christy DuBose, who's now, she was criminal director, and she's now federal judge. So it, it was fun that what we did. And I think we laid a foundation there that I'm very proud of. Steve Marshall and his team are great. And they, 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 they say they're building on the foundation that Bill Pryor and I laid. Um, in the Senate, uh, I was on armed services and judiciary for 20 years. I think uh, in both places, we tried to adhere to sound principles uh, throughout. Uh, we were able to strengthen the Alabama's military presence rather significantly. I mean, we, Fort Rucker was in doubt, and we were able to confirm its permanent status. Uh, uh, we were able to uh, uh, do, do here at uh, Maxwell, and, and all that was under some danger. Uh, then Huntsville became big. We were able to save the Anniston Army Depot that was uh, also on a chopping block. Um, and they all became enduring centers of military. So that was a big thing in, in my time. And uh, a lot of space and defense stuff happened at Huntsville that was important. And then as Attorney General, I knew pretty much what I wanted to do. I'd been Alabama Attorney General, but I'd been 12 years in the Department of Justice as United States Attorney on the front lines, prosecuting cases personally. I knew what the office needed to do, and unfortunately, you know, the president wasn't happy over one matter uh, that um, I ended up there 20 months. Uh, but we traveled 40 states. We tried to rally the police 
under the uh, period of blaming the police, defund the police, or the attacks on police that were just idiotic. And I would tell them, we have your backs. You ha we, this Department of Justice knows the importance of your work. We want you to be successful, and we're going to help you not make your life more difficult. And so, but at the same time, there was a message out there among the left uh, that policing was bad, they should cut their budgets, uh, crime was not a problem. But I could predict, I saw that we were going to have a surge in violence, and we have, and it's, it was unnecessary. Crime is not just rise or my, like my, uh, way, tides come in and tides fall, and you don't have anything to do about it. Like New York. On the Rudy Giuliani, he was in the Department of Justice when I was, and I knew him. Uh, he and Bratton, the chief of police, commissioner of police in New York, they took homicides from 3,000 that were threatening the very viability of New York City. It hit under 300 five or six years ago. Good policing, effective policing, smart, advanced policing techniques can make a community safer. A city like Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile. Uh, you cannot allow crime to reach a level that it threatens the very viability of a city that people don't want to live don't want to live there anymore. You've got to maintain public safety. We know how to do it, or you do have to support police, and some people are going to have to go to jail. How did growing up in Alabama shape your personal and political beliefs? Well, my daddy uh, had a little country store. He had a grist mill. It was about an uh, eighth of a mile from our house. I could walk down there any time I wanted to. Uh, and, uh, so, and you knew everybody in the community. Uh, my parents could have gone to college, but both of them came up during the Depression. My mother had a year at Troy. Oh, wow. And she had to come home when the Depression hit because her father had invested in the local bank that went belly up. She didn't have any money. She, she had to borrow money from her brother to be able to go from Troy uh, back home. Back home. To home. To home. County. And um, so I grew up in an area that was rural and people didn't have a lot of money and they were frugal about how they managed their money. So I think that was important. The little school we attended, um, Governor Ivey was a couple of years ahead of me in Camden. Uh, Joe Bonner, former congressman, now president of the University of South Alabama, he grew up in Camden. His sister, maybe the best of the group, Judy, became president of the United University of Alabama. She was in my class, first through 12. We had an Annapolis graduate in our class. And, but, uh, so I guess I say that to say, I don't think it hurts growing up in the country. I don't think it was good for me. It's probably character building. I think, uh, I'm not sure what, but uh, I won't expect that. But I will just say, growing up in the country, small towns, there were 30 in my senior class, uh, I think that was uh, a wonderful experience, and I cherish uh, uh, this idyllic, really, childhood. Well, earlier we spoke about, uh, off, off camera, about how Champ Lyons one time had written a letter to you saying people are calling you a populist and you sort of embrace the label. And I actually think popular sovereignty is a notion that's central to American experience. It's one of the uh, key parts of the Declaration of Independence, the notion of popular sovereignty, the notion of equality. Those are both central to the Declaration of Independence. And uh, I think populism is very much uh, a part of the American tradition. I don't know that populism is necessarily a negative thing, and I also don't know that it's necessarily a conservative thing. I know there's left populism and right populism. Populism is essentially, um, you know, the recognizing what the, the people's will is and, and representing their interests. Yeah, uh, Justice Lyons um, said that I hear, I see they're calling you a populist sessions, uh, and it's got, populism has gotten a bad name, but there's nothing wrong with honest populism. Mm -hmm. And so what that to me meant was, and what was in my heart was, I remembered all those people that I grew up with, 
who didn't have any money. A lot of them didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so uh, they worked hard, they tried to do right, they followed the law to raise their children well. And if a system gets to the point where the system is not uh, distributing, allowing wealth to be sufficiently distributed, or the system is carrying out social agendas uh, that the majority of the people don't agree with, average good people. ESG. ESG. Or, uh, and um, DEIs and, and uh, uh, all of those things. So those things, when you defend the interest and rights of good and decent people, then I think you're, you're uh, doing the right thing. Um, but I would, I got to say, I was, a, you know, a good uh, Republican, um, the free market Republican, still am. But uh, I do think that uh, the world is different. And these huge corporations with their huge law firms, this is not free markets. They've got monumental law firms, brilliant lawyers, studying the cracks and crevices and opportunities to take advantage, which is what, so I don't call them evil for it. That's just what they do. Well, and in the example of ESG, the reason these institutional investors, these asset management firms get so large is because it's government money they're investing. They're investing actually other people's money, whether it's pension funds, municipal bonds, uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds. They're, they're using government money in order to increase their private firm. And so it's not purely a free market situation by any measure. Well, I would just say, I agree with you on that, and I do not like it if someone takes my mutual fund money and votes my proxy without my knowledge for some harebrained what, social agenda, environmental agenda, whatever they're voting for, not for the profit of the company, but for carrying out, using that money and that wealth to advance their agenda but it's not my agenda. I don't like it. Right. And I think you, uh, congratulate you for pointing that out. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to ask about uh, your motivation to support Donald Trump in 2016. You were one of the first politicians, in fact, I think the first U.S. Senator to come out in support of his campaign. Yeah, uh, I thought, I was frustrated with the Republican establishment. I'm just going to tell you. I bumped heads with them for years. They weren't listening. So we had a meeting one time on the economy, and the great senator, and he's so smart, he listed all these things that we were going to do to make the economy better. And I said, there's something missing on it. And he said, what? I said, nowhere in there do you say you want wages to go up for working Americans. That's who we, that's the core of America. They go to work every day. Uh, and we'd like to share, make sure they're benefiting too, not just GDP uh, that benefit. So uh, I thought Trump's agenda on growth, on more American energy, uh, protecting us from cheating foreign trading partners that were closing our, our plants all over the place, that finally he had, somebody had the guts to say, we're not going to let this continue. We'll put a tariff on you if we have to. I thought that we weren't getting sufficient strength within the Republican candidates over immigration. They all talked a little bit about it, but when the chips were down, nobody was really committed. He made a firm commitment uh, to, to fix the immigration system. Made a lot of progress, uh, which was thrown away within weeks of the Obama, or Biden administration. Uh, I also thought and 20 years on the Armed Services Committee, that we needed to be more realistic about our foreign policy. I mean, this catastrophe in Ukraine, it just, if you think about it, try to just be objective about it, it's just tragic, it's heartbreaking. That country is in turmoil. Millions have fled the country. They, somebody said that 500,000 Russians have been killed and as many are Ukrainians. I mean, this is, I really think Donald Trump um, could have prevented that war from happening. We need to prevent wars, 
not see how much money we can give to help people get into a proxy fight with both sides supporting them to see how many they, they're going to get killed. No, this is not good for anybody. I don't think the Lord wants that kind of prolonged war. I really don't. So I, uh, sometimes you have to fight. I believe in a strong defense. But so I think Trump's instincts were right about those things. And so I thought that our mainstream Republican and Democratic um, politicians and leaders weren't grasping it. Well, we're you know, maybe I thought that a little a bull in the china shop shake things up was what was needed. Well, that, that it, it certainly was a, a, a disruption to the system as it had been, and we're seeing a lot of change continuing in our uh, our political environment. I'm curious, as we sit here today, we're in July 2024, and uh, the Democratic Party is in disarray. There are calls from some politicians, from many in the legacy media for President Biden to step down. Um, I'm curious what you think of the current state of the Republican Party and, uh, and, and the direction it's headed in. Well, it does seem to be coalescing uh, behind Trump and the never Trump crowd is pretty small. Seems marginalized and, and, uh, at this point. I think that the Republicans will probably go into this more unified. The main reason all these concerns, I know Trump could be bombastic and it turned a lot of people off, but the economy was humming. He would have clearly been reelected but for COVID, COVID. And the media blamed him for everything. And I don't I think he took more blame for the difficulties of COVID than he probably should have. Uh, so he got the economy moving, he was making progress on the border, uh, he was interfacing one on one with foreign leaders. And he was a wheeler dealer. He, you know, he, he understands which some of us Americans don't. Other nations have interests too. They have things that politically they can't do. Somebody, they ask us all the time to do A, B, and C, and we say, if we do that, we get voted out of office. Sorry, our people don't want to do that. But well, they have some of those things too. And so you want for prosperity You'd like to see a free market operate. You'd like to see uh, trade and, and in, in invention and low cost energy, um, less regulations, less taxes. And so that's what we got and the economy was booming. Uh, so I think that, uh, and we didn't have war. We had less war. The war started after he left office, two right. of them. And, and, and Afghanistan implosion. Yes, and Afghanistan was, uh, Trump was determined to end it, but he was listening to the military on how to do so. And I think it appears that Biden just directed them, no matter what, to pull out immediately. And it was impossible to provide the kind of protection that we should have provided to our allies and to our own military. But so I would just say this, Alan. I, this is a very simple statement. I believe. A great nation needs a leader who can talk to foreign leaders one-on-one, -on -one, understand what they're saying, and make agreements and deals that lead to peace and prosperity for both. Now, I'm not a sure, I'm pretty sure he cannot do that, uh, Joe, Biden. Joe Biden. I just don't think, and, and the question I have is, who is making the decisions? Yeah, I think a lot of people are wondering that. And I don't think heavyweights are making it. And I'm not saying they're evil people. I'm just saying I'm not sure they have the gravitas. Or the, or the, uh, if you're behind the scenes, it's not the same as I'm being responsible when I make a commitment to a foreign nation. Mm. These, these, are, these things should last for a long time. We want to have... It's so important that this world settle down, and we've got dangers out there. China is a big threat. Russia uh, is now uh, at a point where it's dangerous. They've got they got more nuclear weapons, more tactical nuclear weapons for sure than the United States does. They're the number one nuclear uh, arsenal in the world. So I mean. 
you need to be able to have a relationship with nations like that. The last thing in the world we want is somehow uh, one of the Ukraines or something erupts into a nuclear confrontation uh, that um, would be devastating for uh, you know millions of people. The I, I just think it's you know we sh we got we we got uh, America should have a leader who can participate positively in that kind of situation. Well. We're a couple years away from 2026, which is the semi-quincentennial of the Declaration of Independence, the 250th anniversary. And you and I have worked together a lot these last few years on civics education initiatives and teaching of history. And I'm curious about your efforts in this area because you've been very involved with numerous organizations from the Jack Miller Center to, the, uh, to ACTA, to the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. What is driving this uh, passion for education? I believe, I think you share it, because we've talked about it. I believe if we do not transmit a rich understanding, an honest understanding of the greatness of the American experience to our next generation, and we're already failing, we're way, and, knowledge of history is dropping. Anybody denies that's not telling you the truth. And so if this pell-mell collapse in our understanding of America, the greatness of this nation, its positive history throughout the world, uh, and we, our people no longer love America because they don't know anything about it, uh, then uh, we have deep problems asking uh, for the future. Henry Kissinger one time said to me about uh, we're standing outside a meeting and the Europeans weren't helping us very much on terrorism or something and he said um, outside of a strong nation state it's very difficult to ask people to sacrifice. So the European Brussels going to sacrifice for some United States deal or something, or a threat to England. It, it, we need to know that first and foremost, the people love this country, and when it's wise leaders, talk to them and say, we have to sacrifice to do A, B, and C to secure our future for the next 30 years, they believe it yeah. and will pay the price. But I'm worried that our institutions are being their credibility is are being substantially eroded. Well, I've been in higher education my entire career. I've been in private practice and I've worked as a government attorney both for the Alabama Supreme Court and the Attorney General's office, but I always had one foot in academia. I was always either teaching as an adjunct instructor or uh, uh, teaching as, um, uh, as a teaching assistant or getting a, a, a degree. And one thing I've witnessed is um, an emphasis on training up activists, as if activism itself is a valid subject matter. When you train up young people to be activists, but they don't know what they need to be activists about, you have a problem, because activism in itself is value neutral. You have to be an activist about values. And when students, young people, don't have any foundations yet and they haven't studied history and it's not necessarily their fault because um, they, 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 haven't, they either haven't been taught it by teachers or by those who control the curriculum um, or uh, you know they just they, they, they just haven't had an opportunity to study but I think a lot of young people would embrace a more um, comprehensive uh, curriculum that taught for example uh, Athens, Greece, Jerusalem, and Western civilization and the American founding. This is an exciting curriculum. These are great stories. And I think there's a hunger among young people for those things. Well, you're closer to it than I. I'm glad to hear you say that. You've articulated the problem beautifully. And uh, will they respond? The great Victor Davis Hanson, you know, he's on TV a lot, and great historian. He says the number of college, university, history teachers has plummeted. The number of students majoring in history has plummeted. 
we know in Alabama, and I know this to be a fact that probably was certainly not anticipated, but we test for math, science, and English in Alabama. The schools have to report publicly how their students did. They do not report on history. For example, and so the better teachers are pushed into those subjects that they have to report publicly. Um, I, uh, so, and it's, it's meaning that we have less qualified teachers. I know a great history teacher that for a bonus, a pay raise, left teaching history to teach math. Because the school uh, wanted to get their math scores up. They don't report. So I would say we need to uh, begin to report history too. And because if you don't have, you know, America didn't just spring out of nothing. Right. Ab initio. Right. I mean, it was a, you got, like you said, Athens, Jerusalem, Rome, uh, and then the, the British. British common law, yeah. British common law. We, we advanced out of that. And, the, and none of those countries were perfect either. None of those people right. were perfect and no other country in the world was perfect so we can't blame America and say it's a failed illegitimate state because it didn't fix every problem then existing in the world when it was founded mm -hmm. that's just stupid and that's the ignorance of history yeah I like the phrase that we need <clears throat> to teach in the founding generation in particular warts and all but not all warts well, Senator Sessions, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for all that you've done for the lives and institutions of, uh, of our state. I really am grateful personally for that. Well, it has been an honor for this country more to uh, have represented Alabama in the Senate, to be State Attorney General, to be Attorney General of the United States, and be able to participate in these things. And uh, it's just um, something that... Uh, far exceeded any expectations I may have ever had. Oh, that's beautiful. This has been Success Stories. I'm Alan Mendenhall, signing off.